Stephanie Meyer, Chapter 22, Hide and Seek. It had taken much less time than I thought. All the terror, the despair, the shattering of my heart. The minutes were ticking by more slowly than usual. Jasper still hadn't come back when I returned to Alice. I was afraid to be in the same room with her, afraid that she would guess, and afraid to hide from her for the same reason. I would have thought I was far beyond the ability to be surprised. My thoughts tortured and unstable, but... I was surprised when I saw Alice bent over the desk, gripping the edge with two hands. Alice? She didn't react when I called her name, but her head was slowly rocking side to side and I saw her face. Her eyes were blank, dazed. My thoughts flew to my mother. Was I already too late? I hurried to her side, reaching out automatically to touch her hand. Alice! Jasper's voice whipped, and then he was right behind her, his hands curling over hers, loosening them from their grip on the table. Across the room, the door swung shut with a low click. What is it? He demanded. She turned her face away from me into his chest. Bella, she said. I'm right here, I replied. Her head twisted around, her eyes locking on mine, their expression still strangely blank. I realized at once that she hadn't been speaking to me. She'd been answering Jasper's question. What did you see? I said, and there was no question in my flat, uncaring voice. Jasper looked at me sharply. I kept my expression vacant and waited. His eyes were confused as they flickered swiftly between Alice's face and mine, feeling the chaos, for I could guess what Alice had seen now. I felt a tranquil atmosphere settle around me. I welcomed it, using it to keep my emotions disciplined under control. Alice, too, recovered herself. Nothing, really, she answered finally, her voice remarkably calm and convincing. Just the same room as before. She finally looked at me, her expression smooth and withdrawn. Did you want breakfast? No, I'll eat at the airport. I was very calm, too. I went to the bathroom to shower. Almost as if I were borrowing Jasper's strange extra sense, I could feel Alice's wild, though well-concealed, desperation to have me out of the room, to be alone with Jasper, so she could tell him that they were doing something wrong, that they were going to fail. I got ready methodically, concentrating on each little task. I left my hair down, swirling around me, covering my face. The peaceful mood Jasper created worked its way through me and helped me think clearly, helped me plan. I dug through my bag until I found my sock full of money. I had emptied it into my pocket. I was anxious to get to the airport and glad when we left by seven. I sat alone this time in the back of the dark car. Alice leaned against the door, her face toward Jasper, but behind her sunglasses, shooting glances in my direction every few seconds. Alice, I asked indifferently. She was wary. Yes? How does it work, the things that you see? I stared out the side window and my voice sounded bored. Edward said that it wasn't definite, that things change. It was harder than I would have thought to say his name. That must have been what alerted Jasper, why a fresh wave of serenity filled the car. Yes, things change, she murmured, hopefully, I thought. Some things are more certain than others, like the weather. People are harder. I can only see the course they're on while they're on it. Once they change their minds, make a new decision, no matter how small, the whole future shifts. I nodded thoughtfully. So you couldn't see James and Phoenix until he decided to come here? Yes, she agreed, wary again. And she hadn't seen me in the mirror room with James until I'd made the decision to meet him there. I tried not to think about what else she might have seen. I didn't want my panic to make Jasper more suspicious. They would be watching me twice as carefully now, anyway, after Alice's vision. This was going to be impossible. We got to the airport. Luck was with me, or maybe it was just good odds. Edward's plane was landing in Terminal 4, the largest terminal where most flights landed, so it wasn't surprising that his was. But it was the terminal I needed, the biggest, the most confusing, and there was a door on level 3 that might be the only chance. We parked on the fourth floor of the huge garage. I led the way for once more knowledge about my surroundings than they were. We took the elevator down to level 3, where the passengers unloaded. Alice and Jasper spent a long time looking at the departing flights board. I could hear them discussing the pros and cons of New York, Atlanta, Chicago, places I'd never seen and would never see. I waited for my opportunity, impatient, unable to stop my toe from tapping. We sat in the long rows of chairs by the metal detectors, Jasper and Alice pretending to people watch but really watching me. Every inch I shifted in my seat was followed by a quick glance out of the corner of their eyes. It was hopeless. Should I run? Would they dare to stop me physically in this public place, or would they simply follow? I pulled the unmarked envelope out of my pocket and set it on top of Alice's black leather bag. She looked at me. My letter, I said. She nodded, tucking it under the top flap. We would find it soon enough. The minutes passed and Edward's arrival grew closer. 
It was amazing how every cell in my body seemed to know he was coming, to long for his coming. That made it very hard. I found myself trying to think of excuses to say, to see him first and then make my escape. But I knew that was impossible if I was going to have the chance to get away. Several times Alice offered me to go get breakfast. Later, I told her, not yet. I stared at the arrival board, watching as flight after flight arrived on time. The flight from Seattle crept closer on top of the board. And then, when I had only 30 minutes to make my escape, the numbers changed. His plane was 10 minutes early. I had no more time. I think I'll eat now, I said quickly. Alice stood. I'll come with you. Do you mind if Jasper comes instead, I asked. I'm feeling a little... I didn't finish the sentence. My eyes were wild enough to convey what I didn't say. Jasper stood up. Alice's eyes were confused, but I saw, to my relief, not suspicious. She must be attributing the change in her vision to some maneuver of the trackers rather than a betrayal by me. Jasper walked silently beside me, his hand on the small of my back, as if he were guiding me. I pretended a lack of interest in the first few airport cafes, my head scanning for what I really wanted. And there it was, around the corner, out of Alice's sharp sight, the level three ladies' room. Do you mind? I asked Jasper as we passed. I'll just be a moment. I'll be right here, he said. As soon as the door shut behind me, I was running. I remembered the time I had gotten lost from this bathroom because it had two exits. Outside the far door, it was only a short sprint to the elevators, and if Jasper stayed where he said he would, I'd never be in his line of sight. I didn't look behind me as I ran. This was my only chance, and even if he saw me, I had to keep going. People stared, but I ignored them. Around the corner, the elevators were waiting, and I dashed forward throwing my hand between the closing doors of a full elevator heading down. I squeezed in beside the irritated passengers and checked to make sure that the button for level one had been pushed. It was already lit and the doors closed. As soon as the door opened, I was off again to the sound of annoyed murmurs behind me. I slowed myself as I passed the security guards by the luggage carousels, only to break into a run again as the exit doors came into view. I had no way of knowing if Jasper was looking for me yet. I would only have seconds if he was following my scent. I jumped out the automatic doors, nearly smacking into the glass when they opened too slowly. Along the crowded curb, there wasn't a cab in sight. I had no time. Alice and Jasper were either about to realize I was gone or they already had. They would find me in a heartbeat. A shuttle to the Hyatt was just closing its doors a few feet behind me. Wait, I called, running, waving at the driver. This is the shuttle to the Hyatt? The driver said in a confusion as he opened the doors. Yes, I huffed. That's where I'm going. I hurried up the steps. He looked askance at my luggageless state, but then shrugged, not caring enough to ask. Most of the seats were empty. I sat as far from the other travelers as possible and watched at the window as first the sidewalk and then the airport drifted away. I couldn't help imagining Edward, where he would stand at the edge of the road when he found the end of my trail. I couldn't cry yet, I told myself. I still had a long way to go. My luck held. In front of the Hyatt, a tired-looking couple was getting their last suitcase out of the trunk of the cab. I jumped out of the shuttle and ran to the cab, sliding into the seat behind the driver. The tired couple and the shuttle driver stared at me. I told the surprise cabbie my mother's address. I need to get there as soon as possible. That's in Scottsdale, he complained. I threw four twenties over the seat. Will that be enough? Sure, kid, no problem. I sat back against the seat, folding my arms across my lap. The familiar city began to rush around me, but I didn't look out the windows. I exerted myself to maintain control. I was determined not to lose myself at this point now that my plan was successfully completed. There was no point in indulging in more terror, more anxiety. My path was set. I just had to follow it now. So instead of panicking, I closed my eyes and spent the 20 minute drive with Edward. I imagined that I had stayed at the airport to meet Edward. I visualized how I would stand on my toes the sooner to see his face. How quickly, how gracefully he would move through the crowds of people separating us. And then I would run to close those last few feet between us, reckless as always, and I would be in his marble arms, finally safe. I wonder where he would have gone. North somewhere, so he could be outside in the day. Or maybe somewhere very remote, so we could lay in the sun together again. I imagined him by the shore, his skin sparkling like the sea. It wouldn't matter how long we had to hide. To be trapped in a hotel room with him would be a kind of heaven. So many questions I still had for him. I could talk to him forever, never sleeping, never leaving his side. I could see his face so clearly now, almost hear his voice. And despite all the horror and hopelessness, I was fleeting happy. So involved was I in my escapist daydreams, I lost all track of the seconds racing by. Hey, what was the number? 
The cabbie's questions punctured my fantasy, letting all the colors run out of my lovely delusions. Fear, bleak, and hard was waiting to fill the empty space they left behind. 5821. My voice sounded strangled. The cabbie looked at me, nervous that I was having an episode of something. Here we are, then. He was anxious to get me out of the car, probably hoping I wouldn't ask for my change. Thank you, I whispered. There was no need to be afraid, I reminded myself. The house was empty. I had to hurry. My mom was waiting for me, frightened, depending on me. I ran to the door, reaching up automatically to grab the key under the eave. I unlocked the door. It was dark inside, empty, normal. I ran to the phone, turning on the kitchen light on the way. There on the whiteboard was a ten-digit number written in a small, neat hand. My fingers stumbled over the keypad, making mistakes. I had to hang up and start again. I concentrated only on the buttons this time, carefully pressing each one in turn. I was successful. I held the phone to my ear with a shaking hand. It rang only once. Hello, Bella. That easy voice answered. That was very quick. I'm impressed. Is my mom all right? She's perfectly fine. Don't worry, Bella. I have no quarrel with her. Unless you didn't come alone, of course. Light. I'm used. I'm alone. I've never been more alone in my entire life. Very good. Now, do you know the ballet studio just around the corner from your home? Yes, I know how to get there. Well then, I'll see you very soon. I hung up. I ran from the room through the door out in the baking heat. There was no time to look back at my house, and I didn't want to see it as it was now. Empty, a symbol of fear instead of sanctuary. The last person to walk through those familiar rooms was my enemy. From the corner of my eye, I could almost see my mother standing in the shade of the big eucalyptus tree where I'd played as a child, or kneeling by the little pot of dirt around the mailbox, the cemetery of all the flowers she'd tried to grow. The memories were better than any reality I would see today. But I raced away from them toward the corner, leaving everything behind me. I felt so slow, like I was running through wet sand. I couldn't seem to get enough purchase from the concrete. I tripped several times, once falling, catching myself with my hands, scraping them on the sidewalk, and then lurching up to plunge forward again. But at last, I made it to the corner, just another street now. I ran, sweat pouring down my face, gasping. The sun was hot on my skin, too bright as it bounced off the white concrete and blinded me. I felt dangerously exposed, more fiercely than I would have dreamed as I was capable of. I wished for the green, protective forests of forks, of home. When I rounded the last corner onto Cactus, I could see the studio looking just as I remembered it. The parking lot in front was empty, the vertical blinds and all the windows drawn. I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't breathe. Exertion and fear had gotten the best of me. I thought of my mother to keep my feet moving one in front of the other. As I got closer, I could see the sign inside the door. It was handwritten on hot pink paper. It said the dance studio was closed for spring break. I touched the handle, tugged on it cautiously. It was unlocked. I fought to catch my breath and opened the door. The lobby was dark and empty, cool, the air conditioner thrumming. The plastic molded chairs were stacked alongside the walls, and the carpet smelled like shampoo. The west dance floor was dark. I could see through the open viewing window. The east dance floor, the bigger room, was lit, but the blinds were closed on the window. Terror seized me so strongly that I was literally trapped by it. I couldn't make my feet move forward. And then, my mother's voice called. Bella? Bella? That same tone of hysterical panic. I sprinted to the door to the sound of her voice. Bella, you scared me! Don't you ever do that to me again! Her voice continued as I ran into the long, high ceiling room. I stared around me, trying to find where her voice was coming from. I heard her laugh, and I whirled to the sound. There she was, on the TV screen, tussling my hair in relief. It was Thanksgiving, and I was twelve. We got to see my grandmother in California the last year before she died. We went to the beach one day, and I'd leaned too far over the edge of the pier. She'd seen my feet flailing, trying to reclaim my balance. Bella? Bella? She called to me in fear. And then the TV screen was blue. I turned slowly. He was standing very still by the back exit. So still, I hadn't noticed him at first. And his hand was a remote control. We stared at each other for a long moment, and then he smiled. He walked toward me, quite close, and then passed me to put the remote down next to the VCR. I turned carefully to watch him. Sorry about that, Bella, but isn't it better that your mother really didn't have to be involved in all of this? His voice was courteous, kind. And then suddenly it hit me. My mother was safe. 
She was still in Florida. She never gotten my message. She never been terrified by the dark red eyes and the abnormally pale face before me. She was safe. Yes, I answered, my voice saturated with relief. You don't sound angry that I tricked you. I'm not. My sudden high made me brave. What did it matter now? It would be over soon. Charlie and Mom would never be harmed, would never have to fear. I felt almost giddy. Some analytical part of my mind warned me that I was dangerously close to snapping from the stress. How odd. You really mean it. His dark eyes assessed me with interest. The irises were nearly black, just a hint of ruby around the edges. Thirsty. I will give your strange coven this much. You humans can be quite interesting. I guess I can see the draw of observing you. It's amazing some of you seem to have no sense of your own self-interest at all. He was standing a few feet away from me, arms folded, looking at me curiously. There was no menace in his face or stance. He was so very average looking, nothing remarkable about his face or body at all. Just the white skin, the circled eyes I'd grown so used to. He wore a pale blue long sleeve shirt and faded blue jeans. I suppose you're going to tell me that your boyfriend will avenge you, he asked. Hopefully, it seemed to me. No, I, I don't think so. At least I asked him not to. And what was his reply to that? I don't know. It was strangely easy to converse with this genteel hunter. I left him a letter. How romantic, a last letter. And do you think he will honor it? His voice was just a little harder now, a hint of sarcasm marrying his polite tone. I hope so. Um, well, our hopes differ then. You see, this was just a little too easy, too quick. To be quite honest, I'm disappointed. I expected a much greater challenge, and after all, I only needed a little luck. I waited in silence. When Victoria couldn't get to your father, I had her find out more about you. There was no sense in running all over the planet, chasing you down when I could comfortably wait for you in a place of my choosing. So after I talked to Victoria, I decided to come to Phoenix to pay your mother a visit. I heard you say you were going home. At first, I never dreamed you meant it, but then I wondered. Humans could be very predictable. They like to be somewhere familiar, somewhere safe. And it wouldn't be the perfect ploy to go to the last place you should be when you're hiding. The place that you said you would be. But of course, I wasn't sure. It was just a hunch. I usually get a feeling about the prey that I'm hunting. A sixth sense, if you will. I listened to your message when I got to your mother's house, but of course I couldn't be sure where you'd call from. It was fairly useful to have your number, but you could have been in Antarctica for all I know, and the game wouldn't work unless you were close by. Then your boyfriend got on a plane of Phoenix. Victoria was monitoring them for me, naturally. In a game with this many players, I couldn't be working alone. And so they told me what I hoped, that you were here after all. I was prepared. I had already been through your charming home movies. And then it was simply a matter of the bluff. Very easy, you know. Not really up to my standards, so you see I'm hoping that you're wrong about your boyfriend. Edward, isn't it? I didn't answer. The bravado was wearing off. I sensed that he was coming to the end of his gloat. It wasn't meant for me anyway. There was no glory in beating me, a weak human. Would you mind very much if I left a little letter of my own for your Edward? He took a step back and touched a palm-sized digital video camera balanced carefully on top of the stereo. A small red light indicated that it was already running. He adjusted it a few times, widening the frame. I stared at him in horror. I'm sorry, but I just don't think he'll be able to resist hunting me after he watches this, and I couldn't want him to miss anything. It was all for him, of course. You're simply a human who unfortunately was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and indisputably running with the wrong crowd, I might add. He stepped toward me, smiling. Before we begin, I felt a curl of nausea in the pit of my stomach as he spoke. This was something I had not anticipated. I would just like to rub it in, just a little bit. The answer was there all along, and I was so afraid Edward would see that and ruin my fun. It happened once, oh, ages ago, the one and the only time my prey escaped me. You see, the vampire who was so stupidly fond of this little victim made the choice that your Edward was too weak to make. When the old one knew I was after his little friend, he stole her from the asylum where he worked. I never will understand the obsession some vampires seem to form with you humans. And as soon as he freed her, he made her safe. 
She didn't even seem to notice the pain. Poor little creature. She'd been stuck in that black hole of a cell for so long, a hundred years earlier, and she would have been burned at the stake for her visions. In the 1920s, it was the asylum and the shock treatments. When she opened her eyes, strong with her fresh youth, it was like she'd never seen the sun before. The old vampire made her a strong new vampire, and there was no reason for me to touch her then. He sighed. I destroyed the old one in vengeance. Alice, I breathed, astonished. Yes, your little friend. I was surprised to see her in the clearing, so I guess her coven ought to be able to derive some comfort from this experience. I get you, but they get her. The one victim who escaped me. Quite an honor, actually. And she did smell so delicious. I still regret that I never got to taste. She smelled even better than you. Sorry, I don't mean to be offensive. You have a very nice smell. Floral, somehow. He took another step forward toward me, till he was just inches away. He took a lock of my hair and sniffed it delicately. Then he gently patted the strand back into place, and I felt his cool fingertips against my throat. He reached up to stroke my cheek once quickly with his thumb, his face curious. I wanted so badly to run, but I was frozen. I couldn't even flinch away. No, he murmured to himself as he dropped his hand. I don't understand, he sighed. Well, I suppose we should get on with it, and then I can call your friends and tell them where to find you and my little message. I was definitely sick now. There was pain coming. I could see it in his eyes. It wouldn't be enough for him to win. To feed and go. There would be no quick end like I'd been counting on. My knees began to shake, and I was afraid I was going to fall. He stepped back and began to circle, casually, as if he were trying to get a better view of a statue in a museum. His face was still open and friendly as he decided where to start. Then he slumped forward into a crouch I recognized, and his pleasant smile slowly widened, grew, till it wasn't a smile, but a contortion of teeth, exposed and glistening. I couldn't help myself. I tried to run. As useless as I knew it would be, as weak as my knees already were, panic took over and I bolted for the emergency door. He was in front of me in a flash. I didn't see if he used his hands or his foot. It was too fast. A crushing blow struck my chest. I felt myself flying backwards and then heard the crunch as my head bashed into the mirrors. The glass buckled, some of the pieces shattering and splintering on the floor beside me. I was too stunned to feel the pain. I couldn't breathe yet. He walked toward me slowly. That's a very nice effect, he said, examining the mess of glass, his voice friendly again. I thought this room would be visually dramatic for my little film. That's why I picked this place to meet you. It's perfect, isn't it? I ignored him, scrambling onto my hands and knees, crawling towards the other door. He was over me at once, his foot stepping down hard on my leg. I heard the sickening snap before I felt it, but then I did feel it, and I couldn't hold back my scream of agony. I twisted up to reach for my leg, and he was standing over me, smiling. Would you like to rethink your last request? He said pleasantly. His toe nudged my broken leg, and I heard a piercing scream. With the shock, I realized it was mine. Wouldn't you rather have Edward try to find me? He prompted. No, I croaked. No, Edward, don't. And then something smashed into my face, throwing me back into the broken mirrors. Over the pain of my leg, I felt the sharp rip across my scalp where the glass cut into it. Then the warm wetness began to spread through my hair with alarming speed. I could feel it soaking the shoulder of my shirt, hear it dripping on the wood below. The smell of it twisted my stomach. Through the nausea and dizziness, I saw something that gave me a sudden final shred of hope. His eyes, merely intent before, now burned with an uncontrollable need. The blood, spreading crimson across my white shirt, pooling rapidly on the floor, was driving him mad with thirst. No matter his original intentions, he couldn't draw this out much longer. Let it be quick now was all I could hope as the flow of blood from my head sucked my consciousness away with it. My eyes were closing. I heard, as if from underwater, the final growl of the hunter. I could see through the long tunnels of my eyes had become, his dark shape coming toward me. With my last effort, my hand instinctively raised to protect my face. My eyes closed, and I drifted.